Welcome back everyone to Tia No, the brave new world with a Code Talker update. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, but we gotta talk about sabotaging the saboteurs after we and we get some, to some comments as well. Anton stood on the river side near the bridge as he toured the fuse. He was not the next new detonation man, and while the commander was supposed to supervise him, they didn't stop Anton from sneaking into the bomb storage room last night to defuse the bombs. The Narrow next. Would soon be sorely disappointed. Well, Anton looks like everything's ready, said Pavel, his cell commander, still wearing that old, old uniform. Uh, taking out a ladder, Anton took a deep breath and let the fuse. We should probably run for the back. There's a clearing a ways away that should lead to a good escape. And the group of officers waited to arrest them, Anton thought to himself. He couldn't risk these terrorists getting another chance, even though it was so soon since he joined. Are you kidding, Mrs. Beautiful Explosion? We can head to that bridge instead, replied Pavel, and the others agreed. Wait, but it was too late. The others were already following the commander. Anton cursed under his breath and ran after them, reaching the ridge. Pavel frowned. Anton, why is the bridge exploded? Yep, did the fuse break? And another Nardnik pointed to the bridge. Commander, the SP, we've got to get out of here. Looking at the bridge, it appeared the officers had realized that Nardniks were not falling, or failing, or falling for Anton's trap, instead heading over to cut the fuse. Crap, we've got to go before they see us. Anton froze if he shouted the other SP agents might be able to end it all right there, but some of the Nardniks were armed. Anton looked back to see some of the Nardniks running, and the rifle in the man's arms next to him. I'll have another chance. Ah, uh, we're going to loot for more stuff, even though it does cost us a little bit of a few million dollars, but that's okay. We're here to beat up the Kazakh people anyways. Every contract, cool. If you want to read about a firm grip again, please go right ahead. But I read that earlier. Very good. Ah, basic motorized. Very nice. Um, grab right that one as well. End of the line. Commander Pavel paced between each and every Nordic member, his head down. It appears we have a spy in our midst. I'm sure we all have our suspicions. Pavel stopped in front of Anton, looking him in the eye. Anton, how do you think the SB knew we were targeting the bridge? I don't know, sir. Perhaps, uh, do we not even have motorized here? I guess not. Okay then. Uh, the commander interrupted. Anton, the SP came out of a clearing, the same clearing you wanted us to escape into. Is that just a coincidence? Anton gulped, pressing down on the bottle to signal the ambush. It was time. He just hoped that Narnix didn't shoot him on sight. A crash came from upstairs at the beginning of the raid. SP agents fled into the room, down to the stairs. Before Pavel knew what was happening, Anton had already grabbed the pistol out of Pavel's belts, holding it to his head. Pavel Lordlov, you are under arrest for treason against the Federation. The commander laughed. Looks like my suspicions were correct then. You answered more directly than I would have thought. Comrades, the time has come. Let us show we don't go down without a fight. The other Narod next looked at him, then Anton, then SB agents, slowly dropping their weapons with their hands raised, the students look, wishing, having no wish to actually die for the revolution. It looks like you're coming with us, Pavel. Please face towards the wall. One by one, they will all fall. Investigate factories in Novosibirsk. Uh, multiple suspects are currently under investigation for disturbing the peace, inciting violence, and for multiple charges of conspiracy. The threat posed by these terrorists is unknown at the time, though. The suspects appear to be involved with the Narod next, and appear to have the capacity to successfully perform industrial sabotage across numerous locations. Suspects discovered putting up posters inciting anti-government propaganda, and several suspects discovered distributing weapons to various workers among the population. After interrogation, several of these workers informed their agents that the suspects wished for the workers to overthrow the bourgeoisie and bring about the workers' revolution. Several workers were given components capable of constructing an explosive device roughly equivalent to SC4. No suspects were captured, of course, and escaped to unknown regions. Uh, conclusion. It's clear that the terrorists among their population are targeting working-class demographics, and those terrorists appear to be aligned with the Bolshevik organizations. <clears throat> Further investigation is required, but it is recommended that the suspects described on the following page be located and arrested immediately. <clears throat> industrial sabotage could prove fatal while government is so reliant on a handful of industrial centers. We cannot let this get out of hand. Feels like our deficit. And death. But, uh, someone says, uh, apparently there's a crash that happens in June of 1963, potentially, but you can solve it by deleting deleting a file in the game files, or asking the Qinghai province into the Zhikang province. So we'll see when we get there. Hopefully it doesn't crash, but not like sabotage. Uh, reference document 7A to 7F. Oh, Kimarobo, you have some claws, do you? <clears throat> Which detail in-depth profiling of top suspects and photos of the crime scene. At 1100 hours, uh, a worker employed in a Phoenix arms manufacturing plant detonated an IED while on break. The worker in question, named Ivan Yahontov, was seriously injured in the blast, but was located and detained by civilian authorities. Yahontov had been associating with su suspected Narodniks for several weeks prior to the bombing, and thus appears to have collaborated with two other individuals, Sergei Preobaznetsky, he died in an explosion, and Alexei Turgenev reported the sick day of the incident. It was not found as a residence when investigated. <clears throat> the manager of the manufacturing plant was not harmed, is quite incensed, but he sees that the government's failure to connect or contain the Narodnik threat. Current estimates place damages at equivalent cost of 2 million USD. There are 17 reported deaths and over 30 wounded, which 17 are in critical conditions. Currently, five employees of the plant are not accounted for, with the site being too damaged and obstructed to allow further searches until a point later in time. Conclusion. The Narodnik threat was greater than previous predictions. Multiple requests for greater resources and more extensive training have been filed at this time. Phoenix have also recorded compensation for damage sustained by the blast. They may have won the battle, but we will win the war, securing the factories. 
Uh, documents 2C and Documents 3A to 3K. Documents in 3A to 3K display in depth files and descriptions of detained objects and several workers allied with them. Documents uh, 2C or 2C displays a map of known terrorist hideouts hidden uh, by the government or cleared by the government authorities, along with locations under immediate investigation. 48 hours ago, several Nardnuk agitators were identified and tracked down by our agents in the field, alongside information extracted from Eve. Ivan Yohontov, a series of raids were conducted. Over 17 arrests have been made against the Narodniks and their allies. Among these arrests are also severely agitated workers distributed weapons by the Narodniks. While not all the currently arrested terrorists have been interrogated, it's clear that the Narodniks are targeting working class demographics with propaganda and have already succeeded in converting workers to the cause. Currently, no Narodnik sympathizers are still being brought in and investigated. Arrests and interrogations are predicted to continue for the next several weeks until the safety of our industry can be guaranteed. Conclusion is believed that the Narodnik's capacity to perform the industrial sabotage and weaken the government have been substantially impacted by the series of arrests and riots conducted by our forces. The Narodnik's will, still, will likely not see factories or target factories for some time until they believe government surveillance of factory workers has diminished. It has been requested that this investigation be made a low-priority operation due to the decreased threat of our industry. The Narodnik shall prey upon workers no more. And the Mountain Patrol. The soldiers of Novosibirsk, exhausted after hours of slogging through the rugged terrain of the Altai, threw down their packs and slumped against the stones. The bitter Russian wind snaked through the uh, mountain peaks, uh, slicing bits of flesh from the faces of the men huddled on the rocks. Jerkius passed out, and a fire was, of course, started. 72 hours, my friend, said Litkin, flicking open a ladder and pressing the resulting tongue of flame to his crudely rolled cigarettes. We've been out here cutting our feet bloody and crapping behind rocks for three frickin' days. A bota, said Litkin, tossing a pebble at the dozing soldier, the stone picking off the old Soviet helmet. Uh, the Boris grunted, uh, suddenly straining. Screw off, Litkin, I was just dreaming about plowing your sister. The smoking soldier ignored him. You see any gnarl next year? How about you, Luca? He pointed to the mustachioed sniper who looked warily over the rocks. Uh, uh, no, mumbled Luca, adjusting his ushanka. No, not a single one of us has seen a soldier or seen a hide nor hair of a gnarl next since we started patrolling Altai. I'm starting to think these geniuses and intelligence screwed up. The man joked and complained, dozed against the rocks, and packed up several hours later as he moved deeper into the mountains. Hidden eyes continued to watch from afar. Just who is tracking who? Oh, do not train. Oh my god, that's so bad. Do not train for that. We have until one day left. And we'll give, of course, we'll launch the final raid. Our investigations of the Narodnik movement have been numerous and thorough, and they've yielded a great uh, deal of very valuable information. We now have good intelligence regarding the location of the main hideout, but with their, their elusive leadership, of course. Um, spends a whip of terror and destruction throughout our territory. To decapitate the movement by targeting the masterminds in the decisive palace ray will splinter it, seriously reducing the threat posed to our institutions. Which we good. And they're attacking us over here. Good. Good, good, sehr good. Happy April, though, as we have a cup of water to keep us nice and warm. Someone else says in the comment selection, comment selection, the comment section below, or from the last video says, Is there a sub that stops the collapse of the Greater African Reichstag? There used to be, but it was taken down by a YouTuber, the Steam Workshop, because it was too edgy, I believe. That was a fun, that was a very fun mod for the Reichstag. Oh, I love that mod. It would have been really nice if it was integrated into somewhere else, but, you know, I guess not, you know. Lots of fun, my friends. Lots and lots of fun. Um, external investments or anything there? No. I would like to do this one, though. As much as this one's fun. What's the way to get a streamlined focal production? Fun investigation? Uh, uh, we don't really need to do that one. There we go. Seal of State. A destiny made manifest. No Sobeus has spent the last arduous months fighting its internal issues, drugs, crimes, and social agitators, but these problems have been solved and our positions become strengthened. Instead of looking in, it's time to look out from our current borders. Generals have already been ordered to start drawing up their war plans in preparation for the battles that are to fight. With the current, uh, with the fight of the Federation's army under the command, the conquest of Central Siberia is all but assured. For the Falcon's wings are no longer clipped, and it's time for the Federation to take flight. Cabin in the woods. Ooh, I like that one too. Lincoln squished at, or squinted at the shape that stood in the small clearing ahead of him. Ash fell abruptly from a cigarette dangling from his teeth. It was a decrepit structure. All rotten wood and broken glass. A door, door hanging loosely from a string like a broken jaw. The patrol had followed a little game trail through the Altai Mountains and what for seemed like hours, assuming they were once again following a lead long cold. But it was there, squatting in the doorsteps, or squatting in the shadows of the trees, like a withered hag. Well, boys, said Lincoln, his breath mistily slightly in the cold mountain air. Shall we knock? The patrol advanced, weapons at the ready, bodies hunched low, Boris, rifle laughs, carefully stepped through the underbrush, eyes searching the tree line and ears pricked for any unusual sounds, you should have looked down. It's an old weapon. Buried in the fallen leaves and primed with a short length of wire, the Germans had called the mess mines. The Russians, frog mines. A short crumph sound issued from the ground as the mine launched itself to the height of Boris's belly. The Russians' eyes bulged obscenely, pure terror contorting his face. A microsecond later, the mine exploded, throwing thousands of steel balls hurtling through the air and through Boris. The patrolman was gutted in an instant. There were soldiers flinging themselves to the ground, licking and screaming for everyone to stop moving, having to yell over Boris's gurgled howls as he died in pieces. 
Fear, cold, and icy poured down their backs. They weren't coming up here alone. The poor guy, but small talk. Uh, President Alexander Pokrushkin sat across the table in a noble Sibirsk restaurant from his old friend Ahmet Khan Sultan. It's been a long time since he'd seen his friend, and even longer since they had shared a meal. The lunch was pleasant enough at the start. They engaged in simple small talk for the first time. Until the topic changed to the current state of the Federation. Alexander Ivanovich. Oh, look at that. Uh... <clears throat> My friend, I cannot help but worry. Every time I see you, it seems as if decades have passed. You seem to have lost the old fire you once had. And that's how I was radiated worry for those old friend. Alexander took a long moment to collect his thoughts before he spoke. If I may be honest with you, admit I'm tired. The reality is that the Federation's position of drain me as sure of anything. And that I know you not approve of my actions, as other state we've built, but I know that you understand why I had to be dumb. The bickering in the backroom deals is not a wolf for foolish idealists, I admit. The failures of the old union are all around us, and the failures of the Republic are what force for hand. The people of Russia need a strong nation, led by strong men, not pointless words. You have to understand that, Pokrushkin's voice rose as he spoke. I am sorry, Alexander, but I cannot agree. The people are the most important part of the Federation. Not the soldiers and the oligarchs. They deserve better than to tr be tread upon by the boots of the army and the corporate security. Ahmed cannot help but feel that he had wasted his breath, that nothing could, he could say would ever change its course. Alexander looked prepared to continue the argument, and he likely would have escalated as well before he could. Ahmed let a hand on his shoulder. Peace, my friend. Peace. I did not come here to argue. Besides, I have meetings for the rest of the day. It was good catching up with you, my friend. Goodbye. Ideals can be a fragile thing. Patrol, faster patrolman, kill kill. Let's him fix a little brick house with a cruel eye. It had been a day, a week, since Boris had died. The Nova Sibiris command had quickly fallen back into the military form, knocking off the, old, the rust of the Langor. Luca watched the building through his scope, a scope of gnarled necks and camel around the similarly placed building, or painted building. Eyes nervous and guns held close. A search of the cabin revealed little at first. After a lengthy search, the patrolman had discovered the burning remnants of gnarled neck documents in the fireplace, indicating a new safe house in the Alte. It had taken hours of painstakingly piercing the been bur burned bits of paper back together, but now the patrolman lay in wait for the enemy. Nitkin, cigarette absent for once, raised his pistol, waving for the men to advance. They killed the first few terrorists with knives, spilling red under the green. A firefight soon erupted, the crack and pops of rifles and pistols sending flocks of birds to take to the air. After a brief but fierce gun battle outside the building, the patrolman assaulted the safe house, breaching the metal door with grenades before rushing inside. The actual battle took most of half an hour, but Tulikin and his patrol, it felt like an eternity. Luca was injured, a bloody shoulder, but nothing a few stitches and some vodka wouldn't fix. Hands shaking, Lincoln let each down to grab a cigarette, but found that he couldn't feel his ever-present pack. He looked down, and was shocked to discover that the first two fingers of his left hand were gone. Lincoln stared at the bloody ruin of a hand in shock and adrenaline having shielded him from the pain. Numbly, he began to wrap it in a discarded shirt. The work here was done, another threat to Nova Spears dealt with. Nothing a little R&R &R won't cure, but to uh, calm any sympathies. Left swallow, throat constricting, a dry gulp that brought no comfort, the bespectacled officer sat in front of him, looming over the private in his great desk. The officer, likely a veteran of the Great Patriotic War, thumbed through Left's service record and personal papers. He had not spoken since Left had entered the room, leaving the private to sit in uncomfortable and terrible silence. Finally, as sweat was starting to beat on his forehead, his eyes behind the class, his glasses, uh, or classes, rolled up to meet his. Mr. Gonchorov, he began in his voice as dry as parchment. I understand you come from a proletarian background. Your father, Andrei Viktorovich, was a labor agitator. Oh, look at that. And Gorky, your mother was a worker in the automotive factory. Both, he said, eyes narrowing, are active members of the Communist Party. Silence settled in the room, and it was clear the officer expected to have to say something. Uh, he started, a voice cracking from a lack of moisture and fear. Yes, 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 that's correct, sir. I was uh, raised to be a communist, but... Lev hastened to add his officer's steely gaze fixed him like a butterfly in the glass. Of course, so was everyone else in those days. I'm a proud member of the All-Siberian Army, and I uh, my, have myself no social sympathy, sir. The officer continued to stare for several agonizing seconds as if picking apart Lev's words. Very well, Private Goncharov, you may leave. Lev hastily saluted and left the room, restraining himself from bolting like a startled hare. Once he was out of the room, he let out a breath he did not know he had been holding in. Things had been heating up in the Army, and questionings like this were becoming more commonplace. What worried Lev most of all was the uncertainty of if he had passed the officer's test or not. Better dead than red, am I right? You are right. We are right. Better dead than red. Ah, uh, good. And we're gonna go to back to war. Oh, they need m more money. Cool. And our destiny made benefits, and the Federation's destiny. <coughs> As Alexander Polkrushkin stepped up to the podium and began to speak, the audience grew, uh, listened in rapt attention. For he'd been and knows now, speaking of great features uh, 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 to come. It was no secret it began that the Federation was beginning to look, look at that, uh, outward, across the borders of the limited territories they had now occupied, and towards those occupied by the other statelets. Vast expanses, laden with resources, people in strategic positions, expanses that would in time fall under the Federation's control. It was only natural to continue that the Federation, with Novosibirsk at its heart, possessed a special destiny not seen elsewhere in Siberia. It was the largest city east of the Urals, formed a critical junction of the primary route of travel across Siberia, and landed a major region of development of Bukharan's Siberian plan. Was it not, he concluded, therefore logical that the Federation would leverage those advantages to reclaim a land rightfully belonging to it? Further, having accomplished that goal, was it not similarly logical that the Federation would continue expansion over all of Siberia? 
Of course it was, but Christian Thunder. It was not only logical, it was inevitable. It was right. The Federation had a destiny. A right to unite the Siberia. It would do so on, on that great day, would it stop? No, he said decisively. It would continue pursuing its final destiny, domination or dominion over all of Russia. When he has finished, all applaud, all agreed that it had been a fine speech, but many were doubtful that if the dream presented could be delivered, would, would they be proven wrong in due time? They hope so. An impossible goal? A leak. Captain Slava Kozokskov, I should say, uh, Kozkukov, had his spurred instructions come alone. He was unused to the spy business, his body whipped core tense and sweating his civilian clothes. He sat at the table in the cafe, appearing as unassuming and natural as possible. Slava slipped nervously at his tea, not really tasting anything but the steam. Where was his contact? A minute went by, and Slava was nervous to the point of nausea, but at last, a slender man sat at the table. Slava starts saying, no, not him. Lutomar Tauchev, lieutenant in the all Siberian army, and at one time front of Slava, was seated in front of him. Tauchev's eyes glittered at seeing his old friend across the table, but not seeing a word of acknowledgement. Slava, too, kept his composure as best he could. Andreevich began Slava using the code name provided to him by his superiors. Tauchev nodded, so he must be Borya. More nods, more nervous and knowing glances. Papers were covertly slipped under the table, as code words exchanged, and the meeting concluded. The two friends parted ways, and with a heavy heart, once he was far away from the cafe and alone, Slava called his superiors in the army to support Ludomir Tauchev for treason. The right hand strikes down the left hand, and spring Rasputita. As the snow winters give way to the spring thaws, and as nature comes back to life in the many forests and fields of the central Siberia, so too have the armies. Terrain deemed unusable in the winter months are now fully accessible in spring roads, once impervious to the flow of winter machines, are finding themselves clogged with the movement of soldiers and vehicles. As tensions rise, the armies mobilized, it's clear that the war is on the horizon, and if we're to emerge victorious in the struggles ahead, we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. Because why would we? We could do that, but... A little bird says no more. Oh, and happy May, everybody. We have now reached May. Uh, so, someone says, Co-Talker? Is that the old guy from Metal Gear Solid 5? Honestly, I think that is. I played Metal Gear Solid 5. It was a very fun game. Winter's over and the spring Ross Petita has ended. We're perfectly in time. Uh, encouraged for thinking. Clouds gather on the horizon and the Federation has emerged victorious from the sure to war, from the war sure to come. We must not only ensure that, uh, that our people possess faith in and a desire for eventual victory, but also faith that to work to advance it. To that end, we'll work to properly educate them about the future that could be, the Russia that could be, if they only they work for it. Expected increases in civil participation and work ethic cannot be, cannot but support our goals, economic and otherwise, should be, therefore be pursued, and eventually we will get uh, spring training, and the smoother decision category will be enabled. Cool. There he is. Ah. A little more township, not only can better deeply in the all Siberian army, it just been better with, down with his wife, Maria, Maria, after a long day's work when the boots kick down his door. Shouts and screams. Arrived from the house as the soldiers armed with pistols and shotguns cleared the township household. His children cried, Maria let her in fear, clinging to her husband, and Ludomir stared stunned down the barrel of a gun leveled at him. Lieutenant Talshiv said the soldier beside, behind the shotgun, You're under arrest for treason against Novosibirsk and the Russian people. Ludomir purple tongue working in confused terror and rage as he struggled to formulate his words. Under whose orders, Ludomir looked at the patch on the soldier's uniform. Corporal, he finally managed to spit out. The corporal uh, spoke matter-of-factly, clearly unaware of how deeply his words would wound the captain. Captain Slava Kaskuskov ordered your arrest. Ludomir's face fell, defeat settling into his core. Good God, he'd been set up. He went calmly, looking his wife in the eyes for perhaps the last time. Don't worry, darling, I'll be coming home soon. Rot in prison. Traitor. Want to find a raid? Gangbusting. Chief Galinka, steely eyes glittering in the light of the projector, tapped his baton against the screen for the upteenth time. The smoky room was full of serious face SP agents. Light, uh, little fireflies of burning cigarette added an eerie atmosphere to the dark room. The safe house was large and well fortified, constructed in a hidden bunker uh, constructed in Bukharin's time. The Narnox had chosen, well, this would be one heck of a tough nut to crack. I'll be frank with you all, said Glinka, his voice flat and grim. More than a few of us are going to die breaking into this fortress. From our experience in the Altay, we know these stairs have access to S mines, so expect the way to be heavily mined. The door is reinforced steel, and it'll take some serious firepower to break it open, luckily. The army will be providing what excess explosives they can. The crowd was sunned, their eyes on Glinka, or securing the battle map on the projector screen. They will be one heck of a fight. It's going to be a hardest test yet, but rely on your training in the main man in front of you and behind you, and we'll see this terrorist nest blown off the map. God bless you, gentlemen, and good night. Glinka dismisses the strike force. Hearts heavy with anticipation and inflamed with courage. One less battle, then we can maybe rest easier. The final raid. Luca wins, ears ringing, and his helmet extremely tight around his head. Rebel flaked off his shoulders, and like dandruff, dust clogging his mask, he shook his head, attempting to clear his senses. Everything stood still for a moment. A perfect crystal eternity that was shattered by the slap of the back of it on his back plate. 
Lucas suddenly surged forwards. Kalashnikov ready, held at the ready. The concrete tunnels were tight and difficult to fight in, but the breaching blast the SB had discharged had stunned the Narvniks for the crucial moment needed to take them by surprise. Lucas' gun chattered in the distinctive Kalashnikov's language, spitting death at the shaking communists. Bullets flew back at Luca and his team and around Graze's shoulder, already wounded once by the Narvniks in Altai. Luca ignored the pain, and he and the SB assault team began to clear the bunker, room by room, tunnel by tunnel. It was hard, grueling work, and by the time they had reached the final stretch of the corridor, ten of the assault force were dead. Finally, Luca and the suit troopers stood before the command, Senator. It was predictably reinforced steel, and the demolition team had already begun to set up a charge. Luca took the opportunity to catch his breath. Around him, the other SB men did the same, sucking in the steel, dusty air of the bunker. After a moment, the rest was over. The charge is detonated. This time, Luca ignored his frazzled senses and rushed inside, shouting for the occupants to surrender. Crap! A shattered man covered in pasty white dust, blood trickling from his nose. We are done, we give up. Just stop killing us, please. The ringleaders, six in total other Narnecks, were brought into SB custody. The red menace of Noah Sibirsk finally brought to heal. Another blow against failed ideologies. Increased production quotas? Don't mind if we do. Narnek threat ended. Due to our efforts and efforts of the SB, it seems that we have successfully contained the Narnek threat. The investigations by our agents and those undercover provided enough evidence for the rest, and the raid can have gone better despite a heavy firefight. Many of the Narnaks have been put beyond bars, and it seems that the rest have gone into hiding or fled Nova Spirsk. We won't have to worry about any more major damage in the future, and our government has begun to congratulate the efforts of those involved on the ground in bringing the terrorists down. With the Narnaks threat gone, we'll no longer have to worry about our factories being sabotaged or rail lines being destroyed. Our Federation is stronger than any who may want to topple it. They never stood a chance. Ooh, Central Siberian Republic. Oh, what is a risky venture to do? If that's what we have facing us, we might want to save and then attempt it, even though we do have some political power again, but I'm looking at our electricity like we saw last time. We might need some more. So... Hopefully give it up to us, but we will see. Because we are still making two divisions at a time. These guys are okay, they're not great. They're 12 combat with, with artillery engineers, which is decent-ish. Um... Okay, construction speed, why not? Sorry, my bad. I just I just had to. Soviet powder would be nice. Oh, wait, what? If not us, then who? Bruh. Well, maybe I should go back and then, then do Camarovo. But are they... Wait, who's it? Warden's Road? Oh. If not us, then who? Uh, Foreman Costin had heard it from first. Yegor! The miner with the bright blue eyes who had been a worker in the mines for over ten years. Costin had not wanted to believe it, but after the third retelling, it had to begin to sink in. The other news was not a mere rumor or slew of propaganda. The Narnaks have been defeated, the leadership gunned down, uh, and rounded up in a recent raid, the code of a long and brutal struggle between the state and the socialists. Costin angrily hacked away at the stone with his pick, wishing desperately that the reverse had been true. Capital oppression continued, and the dawn seemed very far away indeed. As he used his suit of blackened hands to load chunks of stone on the nearby curtain, the thought occurred. Was it not so far away? Indeed, the Narnooks had failed in their mission, but so too had the state expended a great deal of time and resources putting them down. Silviks were raw, vulnerable. Suddenly, Costin, well, Costin uh, grinned, uh, while white teeth flashing brightly in the darkness. The iron was hot, the workers furious. Perhaps a second revolt would be was, what was needed to bring the whole structure coming down. A little worker, eternal and all hardships, a rural urban base. If it remains stable, strong, and unified for the challenges we face, both now and in the future, we must ensure that people feel a sense of the true community. Currently within the Federation, there is an acknowledged spirit and experience and outlook uh, between our rural communities and our industrialized urban centers. We must correct this. A campaign of education, with a specific focus on appealing to the shared experiences of both communities, will be commissioned. In doing so, we will ensure that we speak to members of both, show them the experiences of the other, and unite them behind all the state for the tribulations ahead. So now, a little more political power, we have this here, smoothed up. History does not repeat itself, but it sure rhymes. We are living in the second time of troubles, with all the chaos, blood, and wars that come with it. Pages of the Russian history are being drawn, or being written as bulls fly, and who are we to become another footnote? So new stock of stock supplies coming in, so we get a little bit more, 3% more every week. We have chaos. Uh, passively increases every week. Weekly addition of civilian chaos increases or decreases depending on circumstances. As of now, it's not critical, which can hurt us, but with supplies, uh, can get negatively modified by factors such as high civilian chaos and the ongoing war, uh, and which is why we can say suppl military supplies are messed. You know, maybe I should have waited. I probably should have waited for that. So with this plan here, we're probably going to go ahead and choose nothing that increases civilian chaos, because that's very bad. Encouraging the war effort is not very good. Divert supplies to the we might do. Gives a little more stability. So uh, lowers our civilian chaos, but for 20 days it hurts our military abilities. Prove our victories would also be actually quite good. So subtract. Actually, that's pretty good, but we need more command power for that. Prevent chaos from spreading. It's not bad. Get more stability. Just cost any political power, which we want to use on other stuff. But we'll probably attack Tomsk, Orosia, or the Principality of Komarovo. 
Uh, an attack will be launched to occupy the forces of this warlord. They'll begin to know about this through second sources. If we prepare an attack on them while they're preparing an attack on us, we'll get the general bonuses instead, and vice versa. Interesting. Spring training. Those are the third straight day of combat exercises, and Private Ivanov was already sick of them. Crawling along the forest floor, the private slowly inched himself forward. The pre attack plan had been clear. There was an enemy forward position that needed to be taken and taken quickly. In the left hand squad of the flying wedge, he was about one of the half dozen soldiers crawling amidst the Siberian taiga. Cradling his rifle, he waited with nervous energy. As Lieutenant Blue's whistle, the young private launched himself towards with the rest of his platoon as machine gun sprayed death a foot off the ground and could draw a burst. Twenty minutes later, part of the platoon sat on the far side of the enemy position, much of it, Ivanov included, deemed casualties. Turning his attention away from the exercise and back towards his fellow squadmates, the private turned back to the conversation. All these exercises? What do you think, Ivanov? Ivanov fixed the speaker with a dirty look. What the crap do I think? Use your brain, man! The Falcon clearly thinks we're going to be fighting war soon enough! And you better not get me oh, killed. Alright, everyone, so tribute pay. Oh, we, we demanded them this time to give us stuff. But then they declared war on us. So I'm like, okay, maybe they won't give us stuff. But they paid the tribute anyway, even though they went to war with us. Um, that's interesting. Break through the walls. Plus 40% breakthrough. Plus 30% attack. Increase the defenses. Plus 50% trip speed. Plus 40% defense. It's only 5 army XP. We might as well try it. It might be really good for us. Um, all right. Um, do they have that modifier, like the defense one? I, I, if I were them, I would. Mm, I need some board. Well, you want to take them out as fast basically as you can. Care about declare war on the People's Revolutionary... Why? You barely have a border with them. Hey, going about the cousin that's been being captured, please go right ahead. We won a great victory today. Yay! Um, for now, you guys can just hold. Because now they're mobilizing more divisions, unfortunately. Uh, but we're going to get our guys over here first. And maybe we could go now this way. Now that we have more support. So we can circle these guys up here. That is the plan. Yeah, that extra, that's a crap ton of extra, like, attack and defense and whatnot, so. Um, we have no supplies. Chaos is getting worse. We were victories. I'd like that one, but. We can't even do that one, too. Um, prevent chaos from spreading. Slightly increases political parties. More stability. What's not to love? Costs a little bit of political power, though, but, you know, what doesn't? Anything that we really care about. I did do a. Uh, better power grids, which is okay now, but whatever. Nice, good, and we got there. Oh, I thought that we were gonna cut him off. Maybe not. I want you to help out. I want you to stay there. I don't think you can help out here, can you? No, you cannot. That sucks. Oh well. And come on, come on, come on. We're almost there. Oh god, dang it! They got the, the infantry division in there too now. Brosif. Stop it. Stop it. And we got it. Nice. Give us all the time to get a little more entrenchment and we'll take the division, but look on the bright side. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today you're listening to Radio Free Siberia, the best news for the people of Siberia. I'm your host, Koryavov Nikotovich, but you can call me Nicholas for short. They say it's because I look like it's our Nicholas, but it's not true, I swear. Today. I'm here to discuss certain criticisms of the current rule of our country. Now, now, I believe in free speech, but I believe that certain intellectuals are slandering our government, and by God, I'm going to create, come to its defense. The biggest slanderous lies that our government is cynical. That is just a bold-faced lie. Our government is not cynical, it is pragmatic, you see. These famous philosophers, they make these funny little words up like cynical and corporatization in order to slander the Federation, but let's be real here. When has a philosopher ever done something for you? Say what you want about the Federation. But it's brought numerous people out of poverty, brought economic development, and brought order. Sure, maybe they've seen a little too, seemed a little too heavy-handed, but hey, I'm willing to sacrifice a bit of my freedom for the sake of a better future. The second, and the one I most uh, find the most offensive, is that our federation is desperate for failure, and that we're too weak to get anything done. That's not only wrong, it's offensive to the leaders and the generals of this country. We've sacrificed countless man-hours just to keep you and I safe from the hordes that lay beyond our borders. We have a strong economy, strong leaders, and strong soldiers who are going to be made even stronger by the first two. And the Federation will be made even stronger as the years go by as economic development increases, increases continually. According to some analysts, we may even become stronger than Germany when talking or taking into account the reunification and economic development. Now, to my fellow patriots, I leave you with a good little song that some of you may remember. It's a little different from how you remember it, but hey, maybe it'd be better for you that way. Wide is my motherland. Patriots Federation. Order and stability. Cost to complete the chaos affecting us. Oh god. Way more stability, though. Mission changed by my oh, minus five political power. While expanding outwards and reclaiming those parts of Russia under opposing governments is well and good, if we do not work to maintain order within liberated areas and secure them under our control, ensuing disorder and unrest may very well harm production or worse lead to an end of our grip in outlying regions. An increased garrison 
I know bolstered police presence would do wonders for the power we wield in the areas we take from other governments in Russia, as well as ensure that nobody dares to oppose our plans, regardless of ideology. The sooner our order and stability to return through the land under our rule, whether recently acquired or a loyal part of our state, the sooner our good and steady governance can be used to make our principles a reality. Mm, what are we not increasing here yet? We're really bu butchering uh, academic base. Research facilities, ag agriculture's red. We definitely probably got to go with agriculture with them. Uh, world of development. We will do external investments maybe a little bit later, perhaps. Um, I'm more focused on this up, up here. Rally the recruits. Weekly manpower goes up. That's not bad. We got plenty of manpower as is. Weekly war sport. That's very good. Wow. For 45 days, daily political power plus 0.3. My god. Holy crap. That's. That's not bad. Help with that stuff. Um, so I want to lower the civilian chaos as much as possible, though. Apply emergency measures? No. Uh, rally the recruits. I like that weekly war support. That's super nice. But it's already minus 30%. Oh, no. Minus 11% while we're at war. Hmm. Beautiful. Now, assaulting here is going to be a pain in the butt. Let him get in, let him move around, and then we'll see what happens. Not bad. Extremely high deficit, but whatever. Good. Actually, for you. Nice. Actually, if you're all right there anyways, you might as well do that. Could you assault this? You might be able to. Yakov Bronin somebody... Liechtenstein versus Nestor Kozin, fighting forts and somewhat over a river, protecting from multiple directions, which is good. As we go, strategic theorem. More planning, speed, max planning, and entrenchment. Very nice. Ah, we have them! Sergut. Occupy the principality of Komarovo. What is this? Efforts will be applied to integrate the former core territories in this once uh, contender. All seats with the cores of the principality of Komarovo will have these cores again. Or, or, will have these cores gone and ours installed. Uh, when selected, we get a little more command power. Civilian chaos goes down, slightly more growth, admin efficiency will passively increase, get more military supplies, add infrastructure, and increase the GDP. The end of the Sabora? I want to attack Tomsk next. Orochia might be the one we want to do, but where, where are supplies? Ooh, that's not enough. They can go to war with us as well, so. I think in the meantime, let's go to war with Orochia. Before anyone else can. Not bad. Gods of the North. Krasnorsk is gone. Uh, this guy's going to be difficult to take out, but that's why we're still making two more divisions at a time. It's worth it to make more divisions into the Sabor. For the last time, Shuk Shin. Or Shuk Shin. The sooner we get rid of the madman's deranged administration, the easier our lives will be. Will be. Why on earth should we humor these lunatics when they would not have given us the same courtesy? Or courtesy. Alexander Pokrishkin paced up and down his office, talking with his hands as he went. For the past 20 minutes, he had been arguing with the Mayor Barn all over the fate of those so-called Zemsky Sabor, and once again, the two men found themselves at an impasse. Mayor Shukshin rubbed his temples, his eyes warily and distant. If we keep ripping up local administrations and replacing them, it's only going to be more work for us. Time we could have spent on more important matters, we will instead be wasted on sorting out bureaucracy aside. I'm not suggesting we keep the subor rather updated to fit our needs. Pokrushkin turned to Shukshin. Perhaps his colleague had a point after all. What's the purpose of demolishing a perfectly functional administration? Just to replace it with something that serves the same purpose. On the other hand, though, the president knew that keeping the subor in any form would encourage <clears throat> a certain degree of autonomy. We'll do this Pokrushkin's way. The cost to complete all occupation decisions will be multiplied by 95%, which means it should go down. Shukshin does, comp does a compelling case. More stability, we get political power, same cost. A admin efficiency, oh heck yeah. Industrial Preservation Act. Ooh. Chaos goes up, which I don't like. That's uh. Military supplies goes up by 2%, becoming 8%. That's not bad. Temporary military governors. Oh, this military supplies gain will change by 1%, becoming 5%. Interesting. I want more supplies, though. So, we'll do temporary go military governors first to uh, hurt ourselves. You know what? That's not bad, but... The Patriots Federation first. Our efforts to convince the people of the need to support the state continue. It has been proposed that we communicate to the people the exceptional nature of both Russia and the Federation, and in doing so, encouraging newfound patriotism with them for the unifications ahead. In addition, by focusing on those particular exceptional properties of our state, such as our independent and optimistic spirit, our provision of voting rights to those given honorable service, and more, we can shape this patriotism into its most valuable form. We need more supplies. Argentina elections, eh? 
Yeah, it's not worth it. You get a lot more supplies very quickly, but if we don't just don't have the means to do so. And besides, we can focus on other stuff like uh, uh, workers' discontent is critical. If only we cared. Sixty-five, nice. If only we cared. So the current amount of civilian and chaos equates to the current modifiers. More army XP training gain. Division training time, a lot more stability and whatnot. Very cool. Nice, even more divisions when Tom is going to attack us. Let's just be real. They are going to attack us eventually. But we do have planes. Oh, production units, nice. For now, let's keep expanding this. Guns are fine. We're going to go to Orochia. Move rank chaos from spreading. Yes. More stability. What's not to love? Yes. Um, we can spend this stuff, but let's save up our supplies. Okay, they're gone. Um, with this one, order and stability, the cost of complete chaos is affecting us. We can change by five political power. It's not bad overall. I really think these guys are going to be the next one to attack us. So, in all honesty, I'm going to do it like that. To prepare us. I want to attack Tomsk next. Oh, we need to occupy them too. Efforts will be made to occupy them. Yeah. So then chaos will go down. Military supplies will go up. More supplies soon. We don't have very much. It's only 84. That's actually very good. Very nice. Thrones by Kale. I do want to do that one, but we need more supplies. Hybridize the state apparatus. Minus five. We'll begin to improve. That's pretty nice. Look to our roots. We slowly improve. So, civilian chaos goes down. Well, we'll see. Oh, prove our victories. Because they're in 94. But right now, we want to do this one most of all. People's Revolutionary Council. Fighting through here is going to be it's just the wrong thing to do. In the meantime, we can cast a little bit of this. It shoots up way more. We're going to bring the war closer. And we're going to attack Tomsk. And then we'll prove our victories. Oh, we, have, we need loot, more loot. Get more loot. I want more admin efficiency, so... As much as I want this one, hybridize the state apparatus. Because this is nice and all. But... A decision must be made on the construction of our organs of the state. It's been proposed that we act to integrate our military and civilian apparatus, consolidating functions, influence, staff, leadership, and the more and more into new hybridized forms. It's clearly the superior choice. Both sectors are inextricably linked into a directly impact our national security situation, and by remaining separate, present many vulnerabilities for our enemies to exploit. Joining them together will reduce a number of these opportunities and better secure the state, the church and state. Sokolov stepped out of the car, making sure to avoid stepping in anything that may be liable to make his day unpleasant while reaching his home. Well, only if that was some bitterness, more unpleasant. He had gone here at least a week ago, and already had been on the losing end of an argument between varying factions in Orochia, the once theocratic government led by the old believer Ivan Zavkoloko. At first, Sokolov expected the new job to be easy. How hard could be dealing with a couple of backward peasants really be? Very. Very, very difficult. Already he had to deal with the reality that had no legitimacy. These people did not choose him, an outsider. Sokolov, no matter his personal beliefs, was a member of the Federation government, a distant, unknowable collection of bureaucrats and politicians who knew nothing about him. The Sokolov resented, if only because he had been briefed a uh, significant amount by Zavoloko, who, in all his wisdom, thought it would be important for Sokolov to understand the needs of the people. Apparently, Sokolov thought with bitterness some didn't think that was enough. He sighed. Perhaps he was being too negative. He had, over the course of the last couple of weeks, been successful in removing most of the incompetent administrators under Zavoloko, who, by and large, were preachers and not bureaucrats. So at the very least, it would show that Sokolov was trying to make an effort. Besides, the cash would begin to flow to Orochia soon, to show how valuable a unified, centralized Russia could be. Perhaps Sokolov thought, for the first time in days, these people can learn to be trusting, can learn to trust again. Hopefully, Sokolov thought it didn't get that much hate mail that day. Contest the Giants, huh? Happy September, everybody. Happy September. You and me, we're going to slowly reunify Central Siberia. Um, I have military supplies. It's not bad. Uh, I might do, just do the, this one, too. Unfortunately, we can't trust the, the newly liberated territories to not fall right back into extremism, if given the opportunity through civilian government. As such, we will pass a new law to place any and all new lands under temporary military administration to maintain order and eradicate extremist ideals before true integration into the Federation. The military governors will be given absolute authority to deal with any suspected treasonous activities, barring direct orders from the government in Novo Sibirsk against specific actions. Although this will only last as long as absolutely necessary, this is unlikely to be popular among the people of such territories, so we must warn the military governors to avoid upsetting them further, if possible. Oh, and we're just going in. Oh, uh, you go there. You go there. 
Ah, they're trying to deal with the Siberian Black Army. Good, good, good. We're going to loot. School construction? Yes, we do believe in schools here. Production? Nice. 63. Uh, let's come back over here. Ah. Research Ah! Good. What do we need it? Where do we need it, really? Honestly, I might just go with planes. Planes are really nice to have. Well, but we might need more guns. Honestly, let's go with guns for now. Because, my god, we're going to need so many of them, aren't we? Oh boy. Move, move those booties. Leso Seversk. Leso, Leso. Oh, they found us. Oh, what are they equipped with? Oh, they're not bad. They're actually pretty good. Bro, go here. Go, 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 go back, go back, go back. Patriots Federation. Hybridize the state. Oh, they found us. Bruh, come on. Shrink it. If we could go there to there to cross Norsk and up there, that'd be probably the best course of action. Commit to the war effort. Division speed plus 40%. That seems kind of extreme. But I kind of like it extreme. Uh, where are we at? Port oh, that's, that's, that's not bad at all. If anything, I want to capitalize on how weak enemies are, maybe, and then beat them up that way, perhaps. Hold. Can you go from that direction, perhaps? Ooh, they are, they are attacking us. But happy October, everybody. New month, new us, new year. And we have more than enough energy production going on to supply our factories and whatnot. So they're attacking us there. Are they both attack. No, it's just one division. Oh, interesting. I don't want to lose it. Get you to hold. Good. So why don't you go there too? Ah. Very good. What was just disposed, eh? Because you're going in there, you must go here too then. It's not going to help out that much, but you going over here will be very good as well. As we're slowly inching our ways over there. Because we are honestly going to need more guns eventually. Gusts. Hokurushin sat at his desk, looking out onto the streets. It was a bright but not bright enough day to block out the shining of the stars overhead. Oh. Looking towards him made him remember his childhood and the horrible poverty he had experienced. Of course, that seems so much more quaint than the poverty of some after the collapse, but it was still painful. He crawled to the top of the Air Force, crawled from that slum, and those criminals and hoodlums had become one of the most famous airmen in Russia, and yet it did nothing. The Germans came, marching still, like the Huns of the West, crushing and butchering everything in their path. He could still remember flying above a town, burnt to the ground, smoke filling the skies. All he could imagine were the screams and the flying bodies. And now he was the leader of the nation. A nation whose principles seemed so in line with his own. Liberation, freedom, decentralization. Far from the decentralized nightmare that was the Soviet Union. And yet no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get it to work. The piece wouldn't fit. He couldn't fit the square peg into the round hole. And so he comp compromised. A stronger officer here, or strong officer here, a stronger government there, until he realized the ball of centralization kept kept going further and further. And now those principles, those principles he sacrificed so much for, he had, had been ripped up. And the worst part about it was that he felt nothing. Pokrushkin felt like he could feel something, some sadness at the death of the utopianism he had, but he didn't. The compromises in his eyes worked. Without them, he wouldn't be where he was. Without them, his people would be, wouldn't be anywhere near as good as they are now. Perhaps Pokrushkin thought the principles of the Federation would be revived. Perhaps the government would give their constituent parts more say in their affairs, more trust in the people, but he doubted that, and so he looked out the window and just as he did as a young man. Reality over dreams. Industrial Preservation Act. Ooh, what are we doing here? Yeah, might as well. Industry is a critical part of waging any war, and for the factories keeping keep the men armed and unarmed men don't wage war very well. However, uh, the current raider industrial base will be unable to keep up with their expansion, and thinning supply lines might mean death or even wound defeat for our enemies. As such, the Industrial Preservation Act has been proposed to keep the maintenance of our current factories going and increase the speed with which new factories are constructed. This act will allow us to industrialize further and therefore maintain the current rate of reunification of Russia. And there's little doubt that the faster Russia is reunified, the better. Of course. Um, in the meantime, if they want to do that, we're going to break through the walls. Ah, Kansk. Oh, there goes Hitler. And everything's going to lag super hard now, but that's okay. Hey, we captured the runaway junction. Yay! We've lost 4,000 versus 13,000. If we can get Lesos Lobiersk, that'd probably end the war. Kansk, eh? Why not? Why don't you check right there with support from your... Nice. 
Ah, they found us there. Not good. We're doing okay. Wow, they are really just trying to kill themselves here, aren't they? That might be enough to do enough damage. Maybe. They are really killing their own divisions off. Oh, and the game's lagging super hard because Hitler's dying. But oh well. You know, Hitler's gonna die eventually. Like normal. That they are German Civil War. That's nice. Goodbye. You know what? You want it old? Fine. So be it. Um, here. Looks like they're not doing very much, so you might as well try to kill them. Right? Right. Come on, come on, come on. We don't want to get there too fast. And now we do. Oh, happy November now, everybody. A little bit more lag, but what else do you expect from TNO, you know? Honestly? If the mod's not lagging, you're not playing the mod correctly. Bro, I'll go in. Bro, you go in. Everyone else is kind of like, hey. And there we go. I don't know why they just want to kill those divisions off, but whatever. We'll help them out as best we can. Expansion Africa, very nice. Well, that's a lot of stats. But, oh, we lost a bro, we just got dang it. We're, uh, Russes. We'll get it back. No worries. Hidden heroes. Go in. This is Lubiersk. Africa shield. Come into the war effort. Eh. 170 is not good. Prevent chaos from spreading. Goes down by 40. Very nice. Prove our victories. Goes down by 30. More war support. Very nice. Ah. And we should have them. We capture the robot once again. Beautiful, my friends. And now, attack them. Occupy Tomsk. Very cool. The Siberian Black Army. And eventually we'll occupy Krasnoyarsk as well. Um, so, and attack the People's Revolutionary Council. Let's get our guys down there first. Very nice. Very good. Not bad. Deficit's not bad. Debt to GDP ratio is very good as well. I'll get there eventually. And Occupy Krasnoyarsk. We're breaking the anarchists for the past uh, month or so. Or past maybe a few weeks. Oh, god dang it. Come on. Oh, so much lag. Once Hitler dies, it just falls all falls apart. Uh, there you go. The game, the game is lagging. Oh, it's lagging hard. There you go. Uh, for the past couple months, uh, all Siberian army has been dealing with the remnants of the Black Army. Almost all hideouts with our whole generals, militias, and other organizations that refused to submit to the will of the Federation and said place a rebellion in the barrel of a gun. What began as outrageous treason acts, openly committed by militiamen, gradually transformed into terrorism against the state and its property. Army compounds were bombed, killing dozens and injuring more. Police headquarters set up in high-population areas were routinely attacked and looted for firearms, and as quickly as they were attacked, the HQs were empty of all red perpetrators. But the former free territory could only hold out for so long. Soon, as weeks turned into months, some of the diehards began to question whether their acts were in any way helpful to the cause. Soon, as the troops began pouring in, when the compounds and safe houses were raided, the members of the underground Black Army began to anticipate. Some chose to leave the free territory, others the whole of central Siberia. A couple even decided to leave Russia, hoping for a better chance at a revolution abroad. Some, however, decided to stay in while they continued the revolutionary activities. The all Siberian armies have been, never, have been ever present to combat them. While the remnants may never fully go away, the Siberian army stands tall and ready to crack whatever resistance remains. The Siberian all, all Siberian army fears no reds of any shade and a change in management. Pushkin uh, watched the tank roll down the streets of Tomsk with bitterness in his mind and his hate in his heart. No, hate wasn't the word. It was some new feeling. Some feeling that combined hate, disappointment, fear, and regret all into one single emotion. They went beyond a simple pronoun. Perhaps depression was a better word from all the changes that surrounded Pushkin's word. Or world. The first was seeing his ho second home. The humanist headquarters tapped off or taped off by the by soldiers, denying him and his comrades entrance to the building. Your organization, said the officer in charge, has been outlawed, dispersed before you are dealt with. They did, and the sudden horde dawned on him there of how bad things were going to get. The second was much less concrete, but just as real. The morale of the people of Tom's could be destroyed, sucked up, and spat out. Friends who, a week prior, had oh, shared and weighed wonderful memories together, barely looking at each other, let alone spoke. The park, once so filled with wandering, smiling faces, had been replaced by soldiers armed to the teeth, as if all hope, all, all ideas had been bled, bled from them, just as if men had been blood on the battlefield. Pushkin sighed, perhaps the grand experiment was never realistic, perhaps it was better to get your head out of the clouds and focus on the real world, maybe all these new men, with their hard faces and cold hearts, had the right idea after all. What is this survival without hope? Beautiful. 70, 50%, not bad. Beautiful. 
And when you can attack. Attacks a giant. Oh, face forward. Alexei Pestler didn't feel often in fear, but when he came down to face with Pokrushkin, the man who led the newly formed federation, he felt his internal temperature drop a couple degrees. It wasn't the secret mannerism of the man that disturbed him, but, but it was the simple reality of the situation. And coming to the terms, or face to face with a man who overthrew his government and on the other side of a jail cell conjured up images that Pesterov would remain, I would rather not have. And so they sat there, waiting for another to make a move up until Pokrushkin spoke up. Mr. Pesterov, said Pokrushkin, I understand that you and Andreev are on less than stellar terms. Considering that I'm in a jail cell, yes, me and him are not exactly the best of friends at the moment. Pokrushkin laughed. That is understandable, you know. I hate to see such potential wasted rotting in a cell. I've always preferred to think of human life having, as having a little bit more value alive than dead or in prison. Pesterov felt his eyebrows raised a little, wondering where this was going. I have a proposition for you, if you'd like to hear it. A proposition, huh? Pokrushkin pulled out a piece of paper and slid it between the middle bars. I'm not an expert in the fears of Crest nor Scores people, nor do I th think I could learn any of the time necessary to make a difference. That's why I'm offering you an opportunity to work for me, for your freedom, for a better future for Russia. You don't have to decide now, but I'll do it! Bokurishkin stopped, a little shocked at being interrupted. That look, however, disappeared and was replaced with a smile. I'd expect that, especially how long after you worked for Andreev. Pesterov smiled in spite of his best attempts at suppressing it. Well, it's not like I haven't done it before. Excellent work. Welcome back, General Pesterov. Very cool. They maintain the Trans-Siberian Railway. Snapping on the embers. And Tassa Giants. There are captures of industry within the corporate giants are a critical part of our country's development, and no effort can be spared in pleasing them. It was with their support that we've turned the Federation into a state truly worthy of existence, and it's with their support that we'll unite all of Russia with, under that state. To entice them into supporting us further, we'll offer them some benefits to reward them for their aid up until now, such as an appointment to economic positions in a government, and making your taxes on them ever, even more lenient than they already are. Well, this will blow the line between corporation and state further. That's a necessary sacrifice for leading Russia into chaos, but adjusting. Nikolai Kamal sat at his desk looking over the designs of his latest helicopter design. I was coming along well, he said so himself, but to say it was up to the same level of quality similar designs had under the Siberian Republic would be a lie. He sighed, rubbing at his tired eyes. When the Federation troops came pouring in, a few could believe it, and before anyone could even react, the Republic's flag, waving above Tomsk, came tumbling down. It seemed to come off horde eyes that the whole experiment had failed. In the experiments of subjects, the people of Central Siberia had undergone a change at Kamov as a scientist, found shocking. Almost overnight, the people and the optimism, once still filled with hope and joy, had shriveled up into a rotting husk. And new, the new atmosphere, the atmosphere of some corrupt a corporate overlord had expanded into the research division that Kamov worked in. Although the designs remained the same, the people changed. No longer was a radical experimentation allowed. Now it was all about efficiency and results. No longer would those halls of science be filled with creativity, intrigue, learning, and breakthroughs. Now it was going to be, show, be about how to make something easier to manufacture, easier to transport, easier to make in bulk. Kind of like when you go to Sam's Club to Costco. Kamov's helicopter was just one victim. He had no motivation to make the best possible, no reason to push the boundaries. Now he felt like just one more researcher in a sea of thousands, all vying for some nebulous benefit. And it ate Kemov up inside. Does optimism have a home in Russia still? Cracking the councils. It was a shock to the many denizens of the former free territory to hear about a proclamation 1821 of the Federation's government, officially abolishing the Workers' Council. To many others, the outcome was expected, and the shock came um, from how long it took. Despite the Federation's best efforts, the imprint of anarchism could not be fully removed. It had been too embedded into society for that to happen, especially among the working class, who, unsurprisingly, made up of the most of the workers' councils. Kansk was the biggest of them, and threatened outright rebellion against the Federation if such an action was ever taken. That, of course, was only rhetoric. Everyone knew that, one way or another, the workers' councils would be destroyed. Many, even within the councils, debated on what course of action to take, but despite the radicalism of some of the members, the majority accepted defeat. The proclamation was expected, and they tried with the best of their abilities to make the transition as best as possible. But the next day, it was reported in the papers of Kansk that three different mega corporations began to carve up the formerly worker run factories, shops, and other facilities controlled by the councils. Within the course of several weeks, the unions, the unions, once so powerful, started to accept their old places in the hierarchy of capitalism. The neighborhoods once more became divided between workers, with the corporations battling out in the remains of who would get what. The cor workers shall be free someday. They have to be. As we entice the giants. As I guess we're at war too, huh? Wow. They're not looking so great there, are they? Kaisel? I might as well. Uh, your deficit's going up higher and higher and higher and higher, which is not good, but the debt's going up higher, unfortunately. But the GDP is also going up higher too, so. It's good and bad. But in the meantime, with a good amount of army XP, we're going to start slowly expanding our infantry so they hit really hard. Recon might not be bad too. Fine for now. Uh, Industrial Preservation Act, very nice, very nice. Happy December 10th. Uh, it's lagging hard because probably because Muscovine is probably blowing up, blowing up so hard it might make the, make might make the game crash. But luckily the game did not crash. 
maintain the Trans-Siberian Railway. The Trans-Siberian Railway serves as the artery of the region, a vital connection between the most critical cities and towns to the continued operation of our government. Letting it fall into disrepair would more than simply be a mistake, as it could be fatal to our plans with the ease of transport for soldiers and supply or support for supply lines vanishing if it falls too deeply into disrepair. <coughs> What's more, much of the economy, both local and national, is dependent on the continued success of the railway. We must immediately set about repairing those uh, parts of it in need of it and restoring it to peak condition, as well as maintaining it well into the future and ensure it does not fall into a similar situation. Good ideas. Ah, and they're gone without us even thinking about it. Supplies, yes, please. And occupy the council, yes. A solemn oath and the two of a proposal. So now they're all done and defeated, but we're not done yet. Because we had to go here to here to, I uh, think... Is it down there? No. Or... Uh, so uh, all around here. We're going to do that. Because we're going to need to. Because we're not quite done with this. Proof of victories. I don't want to... Oh, we have a lot of command power. You know what? We're going to do it anyways. Because it's a little bit more... Oh, wow. A solemn oath. To my last breath, to be faithful to the people, the Soviet motherland, the workers' peasants' government. I thought only like yesterday that he was swearing an oath, graduating as one of the many of the nameless training facilities in Ukraine. He had been young then, naive and impressionable, and doing his patriotic duty to the state. Before the winter war in Barbarossa, before the fall of Moscow and the long march across the Urals, what a crap of joke. The army had been destroyed. Uh, or betrayed, really. A self sabotage at every turn by politicians and secret police who had no idea what they were doing. Officers arrested for disobeying the suicidal orders. NKVD flunkies second guessing every move, and men wasted in futile counterattacks and reckless offenses. All headed by a man who seemed more interested in moving cities in Siberia than leading a nation at war. Now here he was, a remnant of another remnant of the Red Army. Rumors were going around that the Federation's armed forces were offering to take anyone willing. Ultimately, the decision of becoming a civilian in a foreign land or enlisting in an army not in service of a failed ideology was an easy choice to make. I solemnly swear. I'm here to make money. Not me. I don't have any money. An offer from Sverdlovsk. We received a telegraph from the office of Konstantin Rokosovsky, Marshal of the Ural Military District in Sverdlovsk. He plans to attack Omsk and destroy the Black League once and for all, but in order to do that, he needs your help. He wants us to stage a border skirmish along Omsk's eastern frontier. The attack would amount to little more than a series of artillery barrages and is meant to distract the League so Rokosovsky can move in. He promises minimal casualties, if any. Such a low level engagement is unlikely to escalate into proper, proper hostilities, though. Uh, but it may anger Glavkemerovsky Yazov, which will be a problem if Kurkovsky is unable to bring him down with a response. Well, he can help himself. Yazov is a threat to all of Russia. We send Rokosovsky. Bring him in. I don't mind it. I really don't. Oh, Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic? Ah, uh, we're back with the Kazakh people. I love it. When they're here, they're here to be beaten up. I do want to know what's going to happen with Omsk, though. They should be able to do okay, even though they are... Well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Oh, well, whatever. Oh, they're just enticing the Chinese and the two of a proposal. Proposal. The Red Remnants, Red Army Remnants, and the so-called People's Revolutionary Council have been defeated. And the vast territories in Tanatuba and Mongolia are now under protection of the Federation. Administering the new conquests have already proved, become the subject of furious debate within the government, however. President Pokrushkin, unsurprisingly, advocates for a simple process of annexation into the Federation as a regular territory. So I'm further encouraging the centralization of our authority, but some argue that the federally administered territories are stretching it thin enough as it is, and adding new lands on top of what would only compound our problems. The influential play mayor of Barnall, Vasily Shukshin. Uh, it's before a different proposal altogether. He believes it necessary to form a new republic within the Federation's borders, the Federal Republic of Tuva. Not only will this make the integration a more painless affair, but also go to great lengths towards discouraging separatism. The final say, of course, lies with the President. New Republic. They should be annexing the rest. Just another puzzle piece. Oh, I don't want to... I want it. I want to eat it. I want... I want it. I want it. Uh, uh, oopsie. The Three Giants. <laughs> uh, with their decision to offer... Uh, the corporate giants residing in a realm support and official government benefits, so we'll be able to get these corporations over to our side and be able to benefit from their vast resource pool, as we'll benefit from our official support. After all, look at our government contracts and newly conquered territories are the favorite of any successful mega corporation. However, based on all the few resources we have at the moment, we'll only be able to throw our support behind one only one of the mega corporations. Each mega corporation contract, Phoenix, Sabir, and Titan, will grant us a different boost, so we should choose wisely. Loyalty is all pretty good except for the people. Whatever. Um, we're probably gonna go with Sibir, right? Yeah, Sibir. Oh, they don't like us. Their their loyalty's not very good. Ted is not very good either. Now they're good. Nice. Sending out the embers. Sunrise democracy. Sunset dictatorship. 
When the dawn comes from upon the soil of the Federation, the apparatus of state welcomes its light into the foyers and antechambers of democracy. Here at the start of each day, the magistrates and bureaucrats serve the people, counting vote local votes, adjusting economic policies and directing direct the flow of goods, all in the name of ensuring that the people are well cared for at the midday when the civil servants go to lunch. The president and the civics tour the country seeking support. However, like the Tsar's emperors and Joseph secretaries and the premiers before him, his power was never questioned. When night falls and the earth grows dark, the security service prowl the streets of the city seeking to root out those who oppose the righteous dictatorship. Thus is the unspoken model of the Federation, democracy at sunrise, a monarchy midday, and a dictatorship at the end of the day. Quiet falls over the fields of Siberia, and no whispers of deceit could only be heard, not from kindness or idealists. Only the beating heart of Russia sustains its pace in the silence. Just in case, and we'll go with equipment. Production quotas are next. Just another puzzle piece. It came as a little surprise that Vasily Shukshin and the rest of the Federalists went for Krushkin. Oh, look at that, nice. Uh, his administration chose to reject his proposal of autonomous Tuvan republics. The president had been seemingly looking to consolidate state power for a long time, and now the Tuvan issue was only another small step towards that lofty goal. While the Federation was more moderately annoyed, but not entirely unprepared, none were more disappointed than, than the Tuvan people themselves. The people of Altea had come to appreciate what little autonomy they had been granted under the Soviet Union, and hoped that the democratic Novus Obeos government would continue this whole policy. Instead, this minority group finds itself on the rocky road to full integration with the rest of the resurgent Russian behemoth. Sporadic protests and dissent have been reported throughout the People's Revolutionary Council's former territories, but so far, there's nothing that local security forces cannot handle. We can do so one way or another. Beautiful. Oh, we get a core on it. Oh, that's nice. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. You can do that too, because you can. 64. Yes. Beautiful, my friends. And we're going to wait for this one. Even though at this point, I think we might want to wait and stop doing that because we need political power for the upgrades that we're going to need next. We're looking pretty good over here. Don't tell me we have to fight Omsk in the end. We might have made a mistake in the end, or, or originally. But I don't know if we're supposed to unify this quickly because we did really, 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 really well. A little more debt. Decrease workers contempt by one. Get a railway. Beautiful. Oh, stemming of the Empress. Oh. Oh, whatever. Uh, there exists in the heart of everybody of Siberia the flame of rebellion and idealism. Bukharin, for all his failures as the leader of the Soviet Union, has become the Siberian Prometheus. Arising from the ashes of the communist state are thinkers adverse to an ideological debate and discipline, inciters of ideals and violence, carriers of fire and innovation, the central Siberian Republic. The culmination of this blazing passion shattered as soon as the wind blew against the course of their destination. From our sanctuary in the heart of Siberia, the Federation marched out, triumphing over the remnants of the central Siberian Republic. For here, we shall say no to the brutality of idealism. No to the senseless the waste of ideology, no. To uh, the unbridled rage of humane passion, no, we say, to the fire that is burned around us within us as the souls of our boots fall upon the last streaks of ember. The days pass and the future are gone. There exists only the present. Anything else down here? No. Anything up here we really care about? Not really, no. Prevent chaos from spreading, we could. If we got enough command power, we might as well get more war support, why not? Divert supplies, get more stability. We don't really need more stability, though. Oh, uh, this helps us out at all? Yeah, I mean, we, it just helps us out a lot, but we're honestly pretty good right now. And we're the last container. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do anything else here. So, yeah. Not bad. <coughs> as we are slowly stamping out the embers, as we should. You know, with all this extra political power, loyalty, loyalty is not super high. What did diminish their power? Eh, we could. Are they still killing themselves over there? <coughs> a sovereign heartland. Since regions or reigns were the noise and din of the marketplace once ruled, where merchants from faraway lands come to haggle the goods in the bazaars of thought that were once a central Siberian republic. Now their stalls lay upturned on the gravel streets, the contents gathered at the pyre, waiting for the single match stroke, the narrowed next communist, anarchist, idealist, urukids. All are priests of false gods masquerading as an intent of human innovation and power improvement. Nothing they could offer could align a person to his, to his sovereignty. The noise and didn't offer nothing but his flotations with the meaningless. The Federation has embraced the silence. Where ideals have once been worshipped, we have dragged the idols of these ersatz divinities and cast them out. There's nothing noble in idealism. The act of believing in a higher ideal does not render one a paragon. The brutality of ideology is over, and sovereignty reigns alone, supreme. 64, nice. Keep working on stuff like that. That'd be good. Ah, I guess we should one out. Oh, we can raid him again! Oh, we could do this too, but uh, streamline focal production. 
for the nation and become the habit of Vasily Shukshin, who spent hours of the night cooped up in his office, working until the wee hours of the morning. It had been like that when he had simply been the mayor of Bar B Barnall, but with his elevated position, so many things had changed. He had tired, tired, of course. He was tired, of course. And it wasn't like he enjoyed working until a.m., the a.m., but it was something that the man felt he had to do. Probably like many of us have to do as well. Um, Shukshin's place in the administration of the Federation had placed him in front and center of what passed for the uh, political machinations of the polity, resulting in his less than cynical ideals being the natural foil for his political counterpart, Pokrushkin. But as the documents bled together, the words and letters became increasingly incomprehensible in Shukshin's brain. Out of the fog that permeated his mind came the deep words that only ever emerged on the latest of nights. His mind went to the origins of the Federation and how it was originally based on freedom and liberty, but how the necessity of the Federation system had resulted in an erosion of the Federation's basic principles, revealing corruption, apathy, and cynicism. Unfortunately, embodied by many of his political peers, he felt uh, conflicted about his role in the state and how it would or wouldn't play out. He had once been a genuine Democrat, convinced of the Federation's liberal methods, but the situation degraded. Shukshin could do nothing but wonder if support for Krushkin and the Federation in general war had been worth it. After no small, de small deliberation, Shukshin spoke to himself quietly as if, if he wanted to... No one to hear despite the utter absence of company in his uh, lonely office. I remember the struggle against tyranny. I'll hold on to that memory and do my best to do it justice. So the light of freedom flickers. Well, we'll see. We could do that one. I want to save political power, though. Is that really worth it? Efficiency is doing okay. I think it's Borman. Nice. Um, you know what? We'll do it if uh, they, they pay tribute. Okay. Conference is over. Not much, but it's enough for us to say, yay, and I'll go with tradition planning. Oopsie, what? I didn't want that one. She's the game. You know what? It's over here. There you go. Um... Best of up, yes. Ah, best of up, welcome back. Oh, this thing's going on here. Whee! You never know what might happen. Uh, I don't think we've done research facilities yet, so we'll do that one next. But it's a bit heartland, the Federation's heart. Can't wait. We're looking very good overall. We need better health care, but you know what else is new? Go looking, going very, very quickly. Nice. It was a triumphant occasion. Crowds of cheering citizens greeting the conquerors of Central Siberia. The men of the all Siberian army marched with military precision, exuding pride and confidence. The Air Force flying overhead, Shukshin was supposed to be celebrating, mingling with the Siloviki and the corporate suits. Yet, as he watched soldiers march through Novosibirsk streets, all he could feel was apprehension. But Krushkin went well, that was which was obvious. But he could see the divide between the two of them growing with every passing day. Barno and his native Alte seemed even more alien compared to the corruption and apathy in the Federation's capital. As the mayor watched the acrobatics display of that Siberian air fleet, he couldn't help but think something had to give. Happy May, though. Happy May of 1964. But how much are we increasing? Oh, 10 stone every month. Nice. So now, do we have anything else here? Seven Heartland. Well, maybe we get a few days and then maybe we'll call it an episode, perhaps. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty is not high enough. But we diminish our power. Cost 35 political power. I just want to save it, though. Um, do Warlord to build my external investments. Over two billion. Ah, screw it, we'll do that one. Why not? Pay off all over debt. There you go. And it saves a little bit too. 2.2% 2 .2, uh, growth is not much. Yearly deficit's not very good. Um, but I'm waiting for the rebellion to strike. Hopefully it does, but if it doesn't, oh well. But I'll probably see you all in the next episode. If you enjoyed this, this video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll also see you what else we can do with Novosibirsk. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a great, great, great rest of your day.